Okay, hi there. Welcome uh, to a micro video. Uh, we're going to spend a few minutes looking at the, the difference between mandated choices and default choices. And these are two important concepts in microeconomics in general and behavioral economics in particular. So first of all, what do we mean by mandated choice? Well, in, in short, a choice has to be made. A mandated choice is a situation or a scenario in which uh, we must decide in advance as to whether we wish to participate in a particular action. And often a mandated choice is required by law. You're required by law to make that choice. These decisions are often usually kind of public policy questions about you know, whether or not you donate your organs when you die. Some governments have, across the world have brought in the form of mandated choice with regard to occupational pensions. Employers are required by law to enrol people into a pension scheme. Uh, some states, some governments have man mandated retirement ages, uh, although other countries are moving away from that. Um, you know, what about things like mandated online learning for schools closed perhaps by a pandemic or, or extreme weather? And some examples of mandated uh, choices that are certainly topical at the moment in terms of um, the, the pandemic. Mandated choice is a variant of default choice, uh, except that the choices are mandated through the force of law or statutory regulations. So we're seeing quite a lively debate about the extent and scope of mandated choice during the, the current pandemic. For example, uh, the decision in the UK in the summer of 2020 to make mask wearing compulsory in retail shops and on public transport, say for those, of course, with an exemption. And this replaced a voluntary choice beforehand. Uh, will the UK government bring in some form of mandated vaccination passport or certification for those wanting to travel overseas in the summer of 2021? And will this be extended to things like tickets for big sporting and cultural events. And of course, here's a third example. The debate has been fierce on the question of whether employers, businesses, firms should have the right to insist on a valid vaccination certificate as a condition of, of having a job. Interesting, very, very interesting economic as well as ethical questions uh, that these, uh, these current topics raise. Presumed consent, I suppose, is a, is a related idea. How is, is it different from mandated choice? Well, presuming consent is the idea that someone is believed to have given permission for something to happen unless they say they do not. And I suppose the, the obvious example would be presumed consent for organ donation. It's a little different, for example, between England, Scotland and Wales. England has an opt-out system. Adults in England are people over the age of 18 are considered potential donors unless they choose to opt out of or are excluded from the organ donor list. In Scotland, they've brought in what's called deemed authorisation. So if you die in circumstances where you could become a donor, have not recorded a donation decision, it's assumed that you're willing to donate your organs and tissues for transplantation. In Wales, they have a system called deemed consent. So if you haven't registered a donation decision, you're considered to have no objection to becoming a donor. And presumed consent, of course, is an attempt uh, to increase organ donation rates because there, in many cases there are significant waiting lists for, for key organs. In terms of undated choice, uh, it raises important economic as I said, ethical questions. I mean, I think there's probably some justification on collective health grounds in terms of public health. You know, when is mandated choice preferable? It's clearly stronger than a nudge. Um, so, you know, uh, collective health protection is really at the forefront of people's minds at the moment. And there has been a need to change behaviour quickly and at scale from social distancing to uh, to wearing a mask to bring down pandemic risk and to reduce some of the externalities of, of the virus. And sometimes uh, mandated choices are imposed because softer nudges, choice architecture, uh, information campaigns to inform people about costs and benefits, they may not have been sufficient. So the mandated use of seatbelts in front and back in vehicles in the UK, I suppose, will be a good example of that. However, there are some conflicts 
uh, between sort of collective health protection, I feel like the public good, and individual liberties, people's right and willingness, what or need, to uh, to make their own choices. And there can also be a possible conflict between the social good and inequality. So at the moment, a big topical issue is whether people can afford, if you mandate, for example, that to travel overseas, you either need a vaccine passport or, or and, you need to have had tests before and on arrival. Uh, clearly, that imposes quite a significant private cost. And many people simply won't be able to afford COVID tests uh, before and after travelling. So it, it does, it does uh, potentially conflict with uh, people's effective incomes. Uh, I mentioned uh, auto-enrolment just a few minutes ago. This is a really good example of where the government has essentially mandated a choice. So people are auto-enrolled into an occupation, occupational pension scheme. So if you're an employer, this is what this slide's all about, you must put certain stuff into a workplace pension scheme and make an employer's contribution. Anybody over the age of 22 and... Uh, I think if you're earning more than £180, £190 per week. And again, this is designed to drive up people's enrolment in occupational pensions with a view to the long-term demand on welfare states of, of, a, of an ageing population. So we said a little bit about mandated choice. Now let's think about what do we mean by default choices. Well, in economics, uh, there's so much that is a default. The default choice or the default option is simply the option that a consumer selects if he or she decides to do nothing. And studies have shown that consumers rarely change the default settings. So the nature of the default option really strongly affects consumer behaviour. And actually, if you change the default, then consumer behaviour can change pretty fundamentally, but it's hard to do that. So some examples of default choices, uh, your choice of search engine. So we've got these slides, right? The choice of search engine is quite important. Um, oftentimes people have chosen Google becomes their default uh, and they won't move to any other type of search engine once they've locked onto that. Uh, the default settings on a household device when it comes to your household heating systems or your printers or your security systems, often they have a default setting. And people rarely change, rarely change those. And things like your default choice of, of regular purchases from a newspaper to a brand of cereal to a car insurance policy. Oftentimes people have strong default choices which are pretty difficult to shift. And uh, in terms of evaluating this, when people have a strong default, uh, that can make demand for a particular product price inelastic, a low coefficient of elasticity of less than one. Because even if the price was to change, the consumers are reluctant to move away from uh, their default choice. It also offers opportunities for some businesses to charge higher prices um, and include default choices on services such as subscriptions. People might, for example, sign up to a, a mobile phone service or a Sky Sports service, live, live sports on TV, or they might sign up to a newspaper or magazine subscription or to a gym. And in, essentially that, that subscription rolls over every year, becomes default. Consumers don't even think about you know changing it and it becomes a substantial source of extra revenue for businesses. Uh, a really good example, I suppose, is my car insurance, which I haven't swapped and changed for years. It's only recently I've realised in the sense that I've been paying way too much for my car insurance. But my default choice was, was pretty robust. Defaults can also make public policies to alter behaviour less effective. When people are stuck at a default, they have a fairly rigid choice system. Changing that can be quite tricky. But please don't assume that people using default choices and rules of thumb uh, on, on, are acting necessarily irrationally. They may not be. One of the benefits to you of sticking to a default choice is it, it takes away the uncertainty. You know what you're choosing and it certainly brings down the amount of time and energy and money that you have to spend investigating alternatives. So oftentimes people don't actually want huge amount of choice, particularly if they've already locked onto a default. If you can change the default, even if it's a small one, 
that can have quite a powerful effect. So, for example, if you could just get households to change the default setting on their heating thermometer by, let's say, one degree Celsius, if we all just reduced our default setting by one degree, we probably wouldn't notice much in the way of being hot or cold, but collectively we can make quite a significant difference to our energy consumption. I've heard of organisations, including my own school, where they changed the default setting on printers to print black and white instead of colour and to print on both sides of the paper. Previously it wasn't the default and you can save tens of thousands of pages of, of printing as a result. And again, small changes can have big effects. Consider the effect of the pandemic and in particular working from home. For many people that has now become perhaps two or three days a week a change to their default behaviour. And that is going to have really significant effects in things like the, the market for commercial property, office space, and uh, the, the demand for and revenues in things like mass public transport. So once the default changes, that can have quite powerful, wider political, economic and social effects. So there we go. A quick look at two important ideas in microeconomics. Uh, they're both related to behavioural economics, uh, the concept of mandated choice and default choice. Thanks for joining in as always. Really appreciate it. Take care, stay safe and see you soon.